like on other things. Because so, uh, then you will come all of you to the session of uh, overview of liquidity management issues for institutions of some financial services by Professor Dr. Tripan Kali. But before that, we will have the Quranic dissertation. Do we have? He is currently the Chief Executive Officer at the International Islamic Liquidity Management Corporation uh, based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uh, Professor Rifat is a well-known leader and authority in the Islamic financial services industry, uh, both at professional as well as academic level. So as you notice, uh, he is a professor as well. So he's a professor and academic class of practitioner of Islamic finance. Uh, his involvement in Islamic finance include the Secretary General of Islamic Financial Services Board from 2003 to 2011. And before that, he was the Secretary General of IOPI, Accounting and Auditing Organization for Islamic Financial Institutions. And uh, he is also a member of the Standards Advisory Council of the International Accounting Standards Board as well as consultative advisory group of the International Auditing uh, and Assurance Standard Boards uh, for two con for in fact two consecutive three years term and a pencil consultative group, special committee for banking supervision and governing council for ITSU. Uh, he has received a number of accolades and awards which include Life Fund Achievement Award in Islamic Banking and Finance. Uh, from Al-Ariba in Bahrain, as well as from American Finance House, 
uh, Euro Money 2004 Outstanding Contribution in the Development of Islamic Finance. Uh, and then the inaugural recipient is Islamic Business and Finance Award. Uh, the contribution of excellence in Islamic Finance in 2005. And then Royal Malaysian Honorary Award. Um, I don't think I want to pronounce it in Malay language. I don't think you will understand. I, I understand. Uh, but it's, it's a royal title given by the King of Malaysia uh, for his excellent contribution, not only to Islamic Banking and Finance, but also to Malaysia globally. And he has received many, again, awards in terms of academic contribution, best papers, and so on. So I wouldn't, it would take me a long time to, to elaborate on this, but he is an excellent work, as we said, academic as well as practitioner. So we are honored to have him here today to share his thoughts, uh, discussing on the issues relating to liquidity management, and, and being somebody coming from both uh, academic industry as well as leading very <coughs> high profile institutions. And as we know, liquidity management is a very key issues, one of the key issues facing the Islamic financial services industry. So he's the right person to discuss these issues. And uh, we will have a, uh, I mean, uh, one hour, five minutes, one hour. one hour of presentation, then we can have uh, maybe half an hour question and answer session. So with that note, I, I now would like to call upon Mr. Professor Lipan Lukari to deliver this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Azmi, and thank you to the IBB group, and in particular, Ekti, for inviting me to present this lecture. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, salatu wassalamu ala abdul mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Erki has kindly distributed or made available my presentation. So I won't go over the presentation. I will focus on a success story, which I would like to share with you. The story of the International Islamic Liquidity Management, or the ILM. And through that story, I will highlight the challenges that face the Islamic financial service industry, and in particular, how we learn about the specificities of Islamic finance. I think that will add more value. First of all, let me say, what is the issue with liquidity management? If today you take your money and put it in the bank, the bank will have a dilemma. If they keep the money without earning revenue on it, they will not generate any profit. But if they do and put it to generate profits, Tomorrow you come and ask for your money back. They have to give it back to you. Otherwise, the regulatory authority, the central bank in this case, for example, will give them hard time. And so that is always the challenge with any bank, whether it's Islamic or otherwise. On the one hand, you put the money there. They'll make, they'll like to put the money to generate funds. On the other hand, they'll want to make sure that uh, they manage their liquidity risk, i.e. the risk if you come tomorrow to ask for your money, they'll give it to you. And so if we look at the history of Islamic banks, we realize that because of lack of appropriate financial instruments, Islamic banks used to pile up cash. Then the industry developed what is known as commodity murabaha, whereby the bank would put the money there, they earn money, but then when they wanted, they had also to manage that commodity murabaha. The commodity murabaha uh, exposes the bank to the counterparty risk. So if they put it, for example, with standard charter before it was gone, great, the day before yesterday, for example, or yesterday it was by Moody's, they will put it, they will take that counterparty risk of standard charter. And so, but then the commodity murabaha is not a tradable murabaha. How? The bank cannot tomorrow sell the murabaha because it's debt. In many jurisdictions, which do not take uh, uh, debt uh, to be an item that can be sold, they would not sell it. But in these jurisdictions where debt cannot be sold, that's an issue for the bank. And so that's where the limitation lied, in the sense that uh, the development of commodity murabah only looked at a return which at the time the bank desperately wanted. 
because they could put their money in cash, piled up, but no return on cash as we all know. And so the commodity murabaha would give them that return. But then the bank will have to hold that murabaha until maturity in order to trade it. That's part of the trading rule from a Sharia perspective. IOFI came up with the issue of that in order to trade a financial instrument, your assets must have at least 33% tangible and 66% must be in financials if you are to trade your financial instruments, whether it's a share or otherwise. According to the Islamic Fiqh Academy, 51% of your assets must be tangible and 49% must be uh, in receivables. The ILM took the latter, i.e. the ILM implemented the uh, Islamic Fiqh Academy ruling. And I'll later speak why we adopted that. Now, I will refer to the International Islamic Liquidity Management Corporation, in short, as the ILM. I'll speak about when it was established, who were behind it, who can join it and who cannot join it, and so on, the governance side. The ILM was established on the 25th October 2010. And it was, the establishment was uh, spearheaded by the Islamic, Islamic Financial Board, Islamic Financial Service Bo uh, Board, IFSB, that is based in Malaysia. And I remember I chaired the committee whereby countries used to bid for, to host the, the, the ILM. That committee opted for Malaysia because Malaysia offered the privileges and immunities for the ILM, just like it did for uh, the IFSB. The ILM now is established there by laws of Malaysia. It was passed by the, by the Parliament of Malaysia. Those laws, the law of the ILM, gives the ILM all the privileges and immunities, almost of diplomatic missions. They don't pay taxes, they don't pay customs and whatnot. We actually report to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And the law defines the island as a supranational. Now, no private sector can join the island. Only central banks, multilateral development organizations, and ministers of finance who have a specific mandate on trade and finance. But no private sector, meaning no commercial bank can join the shareholding of the island. At present, we have nine central banks. These are Indonesia, uh, Kuwait, Qatar, UAE, Malaysia, Turkey, Nigeria, Mauritius, Luxembourg, nine central banks plus the Islamic Development Bank Group. Now, the central banks are represented by their governors and the Islamic Development Bank is represented by His Excellency, the President of, of the IDB Group uh, at the level of what we call the Governing Board. The Governing Board is the highest strategic policy-making body at the island. They also report to the AGM. As so far, they, the, the governing board is the executive body that sets all this policy making. They put the policy making and the money make executes them. Above them is the AGM. They are also, because so far we haven't got any new members, deliberately in 2015, the governing board said no new members. And so, in 2016, we may have, I don't know. That's up to the governing board decision. Uh, so far, we only have these nine central banks and the IDB group. What I would also like to highlight here is that this governing board has about four committees or five committees. The board executive committee, the board audit committee, the board risk management committee, the Sharia committee, which is also appointed by the governing board on the recommendation or nomination by every member. They nominate the Sharia scholar and it's up to the governing board to, to appoint or not. And then recently we have also established what is known as the remuneration committee. That's also a board committee. Now in this board, in these committees, the board would nominate the individuals to sit on these committees and they report back to the board. So still the decision making is with the board. That's in terms of governance. Now, in terms of production, the ILM in 2013 
money to borrow the asset back commercial paper program and had it rated A1 by Standard & Poor's. That was a real breakthrough because that's where you add the specificities of Islamic finance. We borrowed the asset back commercial paper and adapted to the specificities of Islamic finance. Standard & Poor's gave it a rating of A1 subject to the requirements of the program, of course. There are three main requirements there. First of all, any asset that has to be in the program must be rated A1 by, or single A by, sorry, must be rated single A by S&P. Number two, we have to put 2% time reserve in an SPV, bankruptcy remote one, for every dollar of issue. For example, if we are to issue 1 million, we have to put 2% of that 1 million, 2 million, in that SPV. We have two SPVs in Luxembourg. One is the SPV of ILM holding, and the other one is an SPV ILM issuer. I'll explain later what's the role of each of these SPVs. But we have to put that 2% in the ILM holding. And so that, is the sec that was the second requirement of S&P to give us the rating. The third requirement was that in order to issue, we have to issue through primary dealers, and we do an auction through which we issue our sukuk. Now, it required that at least an A1 primary dealer rated, A1 primary dealer rated by S&P to commit to bid, not to commit to buy. To commit to buy, Gamma is not Sharia compliant. It's to commit to bid. And so we couldn't find in the Islamic finance sphere any bank that is rated A1 by commercial bank that is rated A1 by S&P, with the exception of one, before it was downgraded, Arachi at the time. And Arachi was not part of our primary year, so we had to revert to conventionals who have, according to our pro, uh, board executive committee, they must have an Islamic finance business. And so Standard Chartered was nominated by one of the banks, and they have Sadiq, which is a full-fledged Islamic finance operation. We had also Qatar uh, National Bank, which has a full-fledged uh, branch, Islamic branch in Sudan. And we had also National Bank of Abu Dhabi. These were the three banks that were rated triple A1, A were rated A1 by Standard & Poor's, and uh, they committed to bid. It's that commitment. The total was 1.850 for the commitment. And that's what we could issue because that was the requirement. How much would be a commitment then we can issue? In total, these three banks uh, committed 1.85, and so we issued 1.85 at the time. And so in the program, these were the three requirements that was put by SMP for us to get the rating. We did them, we successfully managed to meet this requirement. I think two weeks ago, we issued our last auction, our, our swoops or our last auction, which was, the, according to Bloomberg, the biggest offering. That was 1.340 billion, not million, billion US dollar. 1 billion, 340 million, right? And uh, we did that in terms of issuance and reissuance. It, I will explain why we call it reissuance. It came up to 15.38 billion US dollar. So we bypassed the, the 1.850. Even now, we managed to come up with a new uh, structure, innovative structure, I would call it, whereby although the primary dealers committed to 1.85, we had a structure whereby we could increase our commitment from some of our members to 2.2 billion. And so for the rating agencies, because they always think in terms of debt, you always speak about what is the outstanding scoop. We don't have any outstanding anymore. Zero debt in terms of scoop for us. Zero debt. All those asset providers who sold us their assets, we paid them. We, no one can stand up today and say, oh, the item owes me that much. Zero debt in that respect. And so we have no outstanding scoop.
what we have issued and reissued is 15.38 billion US dollar. And the last one was series number 21, I remember. So S&P said, you have a very sterling and strong track record of issuing that much without any default because what we could highlight is a liquidity risk versus a credit risk. A credit risk is whereby, for example, all this credit trading will give you a triple A or double A depending on the probability of how far is your default. If you are given a triple A, then you, the probability of you defaulting on your obligation is far away. And so on, it goes to the double A and so on now. But an equity risk is different. There could be, an institution could be a triple A, but they wouldn't have the dollar. In our case, we're only issuing international currency, reserve currency. They wouldn't have the dollar or the competition for the dollar is too much. So they wouldn't have that dollar in order to buy our scope. That's a liquidity risk. We highlighted the liquidity risk. And in fact, our next round table in Jakarta on the 19th and 20th of May is about the difference between that liquidity risk and credit risk. Credit risk, yes, you may meet your obligation. The probability is very remote if you are AAA not to meet that uh, obligation. But the liquidity risk is different. Do you have the money to buy you know, from us or not? When we go to an auction, we have an agreed bid between, so far we have 11 primary dealers. These primary dealers are nominated by our members. And we go in auction to sell our scope to them. And so in a market, for example, the one before last, the, the auction before the last one, the penultimate one, there was too much competition for a dollar in the market. If you are a bank, let's assume I was offering my scope for LIBOR plus 45, but a client would come to the bank and say, hey, I need that uh, dollar very much. I'm willing to pay you up to LIBOR plus 50, for example. The bank will sell it to that guy. You see, so because the bank is a profit-making organization, whoever pays more for his dollar, the dollars that are available for a bank, will get the dollars from the bank. And so if a bank cannot participate in our auction, not because of their credit risk, but because of their, they don't have the liquidity, the, the dollar to participate in that. That's why we make a distinction between liquidity risk and credit risk. And this is a very valid distinction, by the way. I would now like to highlight what are these scope that are issued by the island. These are only short term. In short term means less than one year. We don't issue more than one year at all. We only sell or issue short term scope. In our short term scope, so far we have been concentrating on developing the three months scope. Scope is a plural, as you know. The singular is a suck. I made a lot of mistakes in the literature. Those who call it sukuks and whatnot. And sukuk is not is, sukuk are, because it's a plural, yes? And so that is one of the misgivings in the literature anyway. We, have, we can only issue in international reserve currencies. So far we can only issue in dollar, US dollar. And we have been issuing in dollar because dollar is an international reserve currency. We could issue other international reserve currency, but that's up to our governing board to decide. So far, we have stuck to the dollar. We are happy with it, by the way. Thank you. We, are, we have issued the only school that are short-term and are rated A1. There are no other short-term schools in the market that are rated A1. We are backed by sovereign assets. That's not a rating requirement. That's a requirement of our governing board. Back in December 2012, they said you can only sell or you can only have assets that are sovereign. I would like to highlight the issue of sovereign assets. By the way, no, no sovereign would sell you their assets because that's a sovereign asset. You see, no government would run the risk of saying, oh, that government sold the sovereign assets. And so that is one of the most difficult things, and that was one of the big challenges we had to face. I'll give an example whereby, for example, a country A would like to, I learned this example from uh, the sovereign, the, the difficulty of a sovereign asset when I looked at the scope issued by the government of Sudan. The underlying asset was the central bank building. 
they only at the time they said they would only issue it to local banks, but not to the foreign banks, because on the local banks they had more control versus the foreign banks. But let's assume that uh, a, a country, a jurisdiction, wants to sell its sovereign. We will say to them, sell us a, a, a physical asset, yes, a tangible asset. Let's say, assume that's jurisdiction A. If they sell us the runway, the government runway, right, we will lease it back to them. By the way, all this structure has been approved by our Sharia committee, so we have no problem. We even put it to our round table, the Sharia round table, where it had a wider Sharia scholars, more than our Sharia boards. And so we will lease it back to them. The question is, when you lease it back to the, to the sovereign, at what price do you do the lease? How do you price the lease? That's the question here. The ILM is a not-for-profit making organization. So if that jurisdiction A, if for example, they would today, if they were to issue a bond, they would issue that bond for, let's say, LIBOR plus 300, right? I would price the lease at LIBOR plus 297, less than this 300. I'm not a profit making organization. I'm not here to maximize my profit like commercial banks. And hence, uh, that's how, first of all, it's a win-win situation for us and for the sovereign. When the sovereign, when we agree with the sovereign, let's say the tenor of the lease is five years. At the end of the, five, the fifth year, we sell back the asset to the sovereign at the same price which the sovereign sold. So if the sovereign sold the asset to us at $500 million, we sell it back at $500 million. I know some of you would raise the issue of selling back at the same uh, price. For we asked the Sharia round table in our discussions, did you make any distinctions in your ruling between corporate assets and sovereign assets? They said nobody brought that issue to us before you. And so they wanted some time to study it. We gave them from November until April, I remember, November 2013 until April 2014. When we came in April 2014, they signed for it, they said, there is a distinction, you can sell it at your at the same price. And I even corrected them at the time, because in a office standard, they said you should sell it at market price. It's not market price, anymore. it's a fair value. Fair value can have two. If the asset has a market, then it's market price. It doesn't, doesn't have a market. It's the uh, at bar. So fair value can take both uh, values. And I think at the time, and I was, I should be also be blamed because at the time I was in charge of IOFI when they issued that standard. They said market price. Market price is wrong. It should be fair value because fair value would take the value of a market if there's a real market and if there's no market, it would be at bar. So at least there would be two values there. And so we would sell it back to them at the end of the tenor, this tenor. So what does that mean? It means that the country can raise funds by giving away what we call temporary separation of ownership. They will give the ownership for a temporary separation of time for five years. They will raise funds and then they will have the, the sovereign asset back. That satisfies their requirement that they're not selling away the sovereign asset for a long time. But we also made use of the structure of beneficial ownership which for some, it confused them. They thought that a, a, a beneficial ownership is not a true sale, it is a true sale, provided to register. If you today, for example, in the UK, if you buy an apartment, that will be sold to you for, let's say, 100 years, right? That's a beneficial ownership. During that 100 years, because you own the apartment, you can sell it, you can lease it. In Islam, Sharia says you cannot sell or lease something if you do not own it. But in that case, you own the apartment in the UK, right? You own it for 100, uh, day, uh, 100 years. You can sell it, you can lease it. No problem on that. That's the, how you make use of beneficial ownership structure. And so we made use of that. And in the structure, we enabled the countries to sell. Because like the IDB, the ILM, has no jurisdiction. We have no jurisdiction. We cannot say that. We belong, for example, to any of the jurisdictions of our nine country, of nine central banks. 
to say that we will sell, for example, to the banks in Qatar or to the banks in Kuwait or, for that matter, the banks in uh, Malaysia. We cannot say that. We don't have a jurisdiction. We are only hosted in KL, right? And so we do not have, just like we are hosted here in, the, in Jeddah, we do not have a certain or a particular jurisdiction. That is one of the things that relates to the sovereign assets. It was a big challenge, but through our structure, we might overcome that structure. Now, for the islands of Cook, we also have received very favorable regulatory treatment from almost all our central banks. We did a roadmap on the island because they are rated A1 by Standards and Poor's. They qualify as what is known as 2A in Basel III for liquidity. Basel III 2A enable you to get 20% in capital adequacy risk weightings. And hence, for that matter, most of the members gave us the 2A, but some of them also retained for themselves the right that they could give it a higher uh, uh, regulatory trim, i.e. they treat more than 2A. That's up to them. We also believe that we qualify for the high quality liquid assets. We meet all the Basel III requirements for high quality liquid assets for short terms. Now, on, in addition to this, uh, we believe that our Sukub, right, help as stated in our objective. We help Islamic institutions that offer Islamic finance service to manage their liquidity. They can buy, they can offload it. I'll talk about the tradability now. We have two types, as I said, of primary deals, the conventional ones that have Islamic finance operations, like Standard Chartered, like Qatar National Bank, like MBAT in, in the UAE. But we also have others uh, out of the 11, we have nine others who are Islamic, like Kuwait Finance House, we have Abu Dhabi Islamic Banks, and the like, we have Qatar Islamic Banks. Now for the convention, they can buy our, our scoop today, and tomorrow they can offload it by selling it to anybody, right? But for the Islamic banks, they are guided by the rule of tradability. They cannot sell it unless if it is, according to IOFI, 63% tangible or 66 and 67% receivable, or according to the Islamic Sakh Academy, 51% tangible and 49% receivables. We adhere to the Islamic Sakh Academy. Why? Because if, for example, Kuwait Finance House, they buy it from us, and they would like to offload it by selling it to another Islamic bank. Those Islamic banks may not subscribe to the IOPIS ruling, but so far as I understand, every Islamic bank subscribes to the Islamic Fiqh Academy. And so we went to the higher one, 51%. At present, I think we have 67 or just below that tangible assets. The rest is receivables. And so we have subscribed to a higher ruling of the Islamic Fiqh Academy for the tradability of our support. If we didn't do that, the conventional banks would, would sell it. There would be an arbitrage between the uh, conventional banks and the Islamic banks. If the convention can sell it tomorrow, I offload it from their balance sheet and send it to whoever. And if the Islamic banks couldn't, uh, because ours was not tradable, neither through the IOFI nor through the Islamic Fiqh Academy, that would create an arbitrage for the conventional banks. And we didn't want that. We don't want to disadvantage Islamic banks in our uh, in our uh, structure. We have also seen that because of this, perhaps Islamic banks are now more, they have overtaken the conventional bank in terms of buying the, the our suhoop and selling them. We don't believe in secondary market except in the bank offloading it, because if today I issue one day instrument. How would you measure the secondary market that the bank will, by the time they hold it until tomorrow, there's no secondary market, but the secondary market comes in terms of them offloading it from their balance sheet. If, for example, it is not a tradable issue, right, the bank will have to hold it like commodity morabha, perhaps, until commodity, until maturity. We have three members in our jurisdictions or in our members we have three, you know, uh, three, we have three members who, in their jurisdiction, there is a critical mass of Islamic banks. These are uh, Malaysia, Qatar, 
Kuwait and UAE. And because of that, these central banks, in order to facilitate liquidity management for these critical mass of Islamic banks, they issue uh, Islamic money market instruments. But the problem is that it, all these Islamic money market instruments are based on commodity murabah, so they cannot be traded. The banks have to hold it to maturity. Ours can be traded, that's an advantage. And these uh, uh, members can only issue, the central bank can only issue in their own local currency. That's how the backing comes from the legal side. We issue in international reserve currency, the dollar. So ours help in cross-border <coughs> as well. Now, these are some of the advantages of our ILM uh, support. I think I would like to stop here, Mr. Chairman, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Schiller, let me give you a brief recap. Brother, can you go to the last slide? Last slide. The last slide. This is the snapshot. Yeah. I see. Uh, no, 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 the last. No, the, where you have this iron and shot them to cook. Yes. Yeah. I saw it because you took more just to talk about yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, I just wanted to talk about people can look at it. So, uh, uh, yes, yes. Okay, fine. So, uh, as you can see from here, what uh, Professor Lipan is talking about is on the role of uh, IILM uh, in resolving the liquidity management issues faced by Islamic banks globally. So, the instrument that uh, that was important is issued by ILM is this US dollar denominated short term suku, which it says is about three months uh, maturity period. And uh, apart from, I mean, as opposed to many other institutions and instruments, this is the globally accepted uh, suku across all Sharia committees. And it is tradable because the assets are more than 51%. As you know, one of the key things in issuing of suku is to have sufficient tangible assets. Uh, hence, there are suku that cannot that, that were issued but cannot be traded because they do not meet the requirement of the 51% tangible asset uh, requirement. And uh, finally, it is also backed by sovereign assets. Uh, countries provide the assets for the issuance of suku. And more importantly, it has received favorable regulatory treatments from the member countries. And this is a, a, a very important, I would say, significant milestone in terms of getting the acceptance of, of Suku being uh, not only the liquidity instrument, but also the treatment. I think that's, that's in essence what, uh, what Professor Lefant is, is, is stated. So again, uh, we now welcome the comments and questions, of course, from the members of the board. Yes, yes. Well, I think it's a very remarkable uh, success story that uh, was done. I think uh, all the central banks uh, in my legal and also the management of ILM uh, deserve uh, our thanks and appreciation for the, for the success of this, uh, of this uh, venture. And I think uh, we still need to see, inshallah, more projects coming, more uh, of collaboration coming. My question to the current uh, in the area of collaboration, recently we have collaborated with our tourists, uh, uh, you know, invested uh, invest in, uh, on ICD. Uh, the question I have uh, for you, uh, that as, as we engage on advising governments and uh, all the countries which is to cook, uh, uh, which is a little bit different from the business model that you are having. Uh, can we imagine a situation where you can uh, use the scope issued by the governments uh, as the assets uh, rather than fiscal assets? Because at the end of the day, it's also the when we issue scope for governments, we uh, also uh, <coughs> the same, make sure that there is a tangible asset to them. This and make, you know, the scope that we issue in Senegal could have are all the government buildings, so it's actually 100% tangible assets. Can you use this to issue your own scope? So rather than you know, fiscal assets, it's papers that backed by fiscal assets. So that will probably 
allow you and, and, and us to make uh, this coconut duration uh, more tradable uh, for the liquidity management. Very interesting. So you have a second layer. Yes. I, I think we can, and I see why I think we can. Because I didn't deliberately did not explain more on the structure of the of the work of the assets providers to us. The asset providers give us, according to that beneficial ownership structure, the, they sell, the, the sovereign will not sell the, us their sukuk, they'll sell it to a local SPV, which will sell us a beneficial ownership in sukuk. So sukuk, a suck is a, a, an asset for us. A suck is an asset for us. And that's why I say it can, but we will put it, as you know, to our Sharia committee to approve it. I have no problem with that. But if you look again at the ruling of the Stan of Fiqh Academy, it says Manafa wa Ayan. The Ayan is of the service, yes? And Ayan are the tangible assets. So first of all, we have only looked at the tangible assets. But we would like also now to look at the other side of it, the services. But Sukuk is a, a tangible asset, I can tell you, sir. Because otherwise we would be defeating our own structure. Number two, we never say, for example, if Nigeria, our member, right? If they sell us uh, uh, an asset, we never say that this asset came from Nigeria. Why? Because then the market will price our sukuk as Nigerian sukuk. We always, uh, although our sukuk are rated A1, we never identify where that asset came from. We can say it's from Africa. We can give you every details, short of naming the country. And so we would never say, for example, this came from ICD or whatever, right? The market doesn't know that because if ICD, for example, uh, they are rated triple B or junk, right? The market will price our swoop that we issue for the short term. They will tend to mark, uh, price it as a junk support, right? Rather than the rating of our swoop, which is A1. That's one of the reasons. But I, I agree, yes, support is a tangible as which we can use. And that will make a different thing together. True. Yes, thank you, Khat, for that. Yes. Maybe we can collect a few more questions. Yes. yes. Two, and then I thought I saw. Yes. Yeah. No, right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Raj, for this interesting success story about Nabil uh, I have uh, three questions. The first one is about uh, the credibility of the uh, as per the IOP standard and the Fiqh Academy, the percentage of tangible asset. The IOP is mentioning 33 percent as you mentioned it, and the Fiqh Academy 51 percent. My question here is about at which point of time we can say that 51 percent is tangible and the rest is are receiving, which means credibility happens every day or even every hour. So when we can say that this part is tangible, this part is not tangible. This is my first question. Can I answer that before you go to the second one? Ah. Otherwise, I'll forget. <laughs> what? I would like to answer this question before I go. you go to the second one. Otherwise, I may forget. Okay. In terms of tangibility, at the portfolio level, right now, we have what I said. I said we have more than 63% tangible assets, right? So even if it changes by the by the hour, as you said, we don't have that. We, are, for ourselves, we have to get an asset provider, a sovereign, right? And a sovereign will not change by an hour because they would like to go for a festival for a long term. Ours is a short term. So that's what I call a mismatch. Somebody said, oh, you have a great mismatch. I said, no, we don't have a mismatch. The mismatch in the literature and that's where the confusion takes place. The mismatch is mismatch of maturity of debt. If today I borrow short and lend long, right? That's a mismatch of maturity of debt. Our mismatch is a mismatch of period, whereby the sovereign always like to have long term, right? So, and I said the lease for five years, for example, and then we issue it short term. So I can, because I have a long term asset for five years, I can go on issuing and reissuing it. Why do I say reissuance? Because in an auction through which I issue, I may have a different size. One time it was 480, second time it was 860, the last time it was 1,340,000, right? 
So it's a different size. I would also have a different price. 28, 29, Liber Plus 28, 29, 30, 32, up to 45. Now it's going down to 42, right? So it's a different price. Number three, uh, the location. I may give standard chart, for example, in this auction, 100 million. In the next auction, I may give them only 50 and so on. So it's unlike that. That talks about rollover, right? Rollover, usually you talk about the same terms of this original debt. You roll it over. I don't talk about that. I have three important factors that change price, size, and allocation. And so we call them reissuance. That's the nearest we call. So that's why in every auction we have a risk, a risk of getting a full, you know, coverage from the primary dealers and a risk of the size because it might be more or less, right? And so every time I say, if it's a reissuance, there is a risk for us. That's why when I added the issuance and the reissuance, it came to 15 billion, or 15.78 billion. That's what we have issued and reached so far until two, two weeks ago. Go ahead, second one. Second one is about uh, membership. You mentioned that until now there are nine jurisdictions. So, for which years? After about five years of the Okay. As we all know, initially the IRM did not make profits, right? It only started making profit in 2014. Now, you have nine because this is what we call the angel investors. Just like the IFSB, by the way, the IFSB starts also with nine. These are the ones who would risk joining an institution, like any startup, right? You have an angel investors. They will come, the others will wait and see. If you succeed, they will join. If they don't, if you don't succeed, they will not join, right? So they are managing their risk. I think now with what we have achieved so far, we expect that we pay, when we took over, when I took over, sorry, in October 2012, out of the 75 million, right, that was the paid up capital, available was only 51 or 52, Ernie, am I right? 52, 52 million. So you can say 28 million, was invested in the organization. Now we didn't make any profit until 2014. We expect by 2018 we pay all this 28 back. So perhaps from now on in 2016 there will be more to join. Now there is at least some light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Uh, my last question is about uh, related also to membership. You highlighted that commercial banks are not part of. Can you? So when a government gives privileges to an institution, they would not like to differentiate between a, a one private or if, for example, private sector joins us, right? They will be private to all these benefits. I don't think any government would do that. Number two, I strongly believe that liquidity management is an issue with central banks. That's one of the biggest issues, le lessons we learned from the le uh, recent global financial crisis, is that when you have liquidity, these days do you hear anybody other than governors of central banks being quoted in the, in the media? Because they believe that they are the only one who can manage that. It's an issue of liquidity, to be honest. And sometimes they say well, they went for unorthodox measures of having negative uh, risk, uh, rate of return or rate of interest, whatever, you know but it's still the central bank that matters. I think that's when we thought about the, at the IFSB, when they thought about the ILM, that was, <coughs> sorry, 2008, just as the financial crisis was taking place. And I would give them the credit for that. I think His Excellency, the president at the time, wrote to uh, the governor, uh, the present governor of Bank Bigar, Governor Zeki, asking if she could chair a, a committee uh, to highlight the stability of the Islamic finance versus the global uh, finance after the crisis. And one of the recommendations of that uh, report, uh, among others, was the establishment of an institution that would cater for liquidity. I also remember I attended here in the IDB at the time a seminar that was to be chaired by the then Vice President of Finance, on liquidity management, but then they pass it over to that uh, uh, that body. 
IFSB took it from there and then they issued the ILM. Thank you very much. I'd like uh, first to uh, welcome uh, Professor Repat, uh, who is uh, my godfather in design finance. I learned design finance, started the learning design finance uh, uh, from him. Until today, we are uh, proud and always uh, learning from him. So I watched it, uh, I was a witness of the success story of IOFI, IFSB, and ILM. I, I remember in 2008 uh, when Professor uh, Repat shared with me the concept paper, it was uh, four pages. Uh, uh, about ILM and uh, the, 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 the novel idea behind that, and uh, like working. Uh, my, my first question, uh, Professor, uh, 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 what you expect uh, uh, for ILM in the next five years, uh, based on the, uh, the, the experience from 2012, which is, was a very difficult time to, to take over uh, the operation of ILM, while there was a big loss, uh, in, no issuance uh, in place for almost one year and a half. And uh, it's been turned, and we can see, you can watch this uh, success so Still, uh, members with 15 million billion, I think. Uh, your, your expectation at the time of 2008 was bigger than this, and uh, I think still we are suffering, and there the, are the a lot of the challenges in the market today because of the liquidity, because of the oil price, the, the challenges facing the um, more media, media countries, uh, recovery, reconstruction, the need. Uh, this is number one. Number two, um, we are talking about the assets uh, related, which is uh, uh, no disclosure available for the assets, which is, I agree, this is also to have uh, what we call it, uh, a strong platform to be able to create such uh, liquidity platform. But still, how, how you deal, uh, I, mean, I know some uh, information from you directly, but I'd like to share with uh, the, 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 our <coughs> colleagues here, how, how we can uh, differentiate between the risk or uh, political risk related to assets, for example, in Nigeria and assets in Saudi Arabia or Kuwait, because still there is uh, this asset attached to such a political risk and which is, has a great impact on the pricing. So how do you deal with this? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmed. With regard to what we expect of the ILM, I think we're now working to have it as a benchmark, you know, because there's no, to be honest, we don't have a strong benchmark for short term. So that will only come by issuance and issuance. But I, when I read the Bloomberg article last week, uh, I think uh, uh, one of those who commented on it was from Moody's in Dubai, Khalid. And I think he erred because they always look at these things from a dead point of view. He said, Ali may have issued one or two billion. Even though before that, uh, uh, somebody said, ILM is now systemic risk. When we asked them why for movies, they said, well, their issuance has gone more than 10%. But you see, what he was talking about, the 2.2, Khalid, I think he was referring to the outstanding. We don't have any outstanding. And so they, as I said, they don't cater, they don't count, count the, what they call the rollover. Because the debt is a debt, no matter how many you trying to roll it over. Right? Mm -hmm. In our case, it's not. It's the first time that if you would like to go by them, our issuance is 2.2 billion. Now, issuance and reissuance goes to 15.38 billion. You cannot just forget about that 15.38 altogether. Because as I said, there are different factors, the factor of size, the factor of price, and the factor of allocation to our primary dealers. These are three major factors which we face in a risk in every uh, auction. So it's not a rollover. It's not a debt in the first place. And hence, we do not call them outstanding support. We call them community support because that's a community issue for us. And hence, it's issuance and reissuance. We look at the word reissuance as the nearest correct one. Perhaps somebody will correct us. We welcome that. That's number one. Number two, no disclosures of assets origin. Am I right? Okay. You see, we have separated the risk. We take the risk of the asset provider. If today country A, for example, provides us with an asset, right? And then we issue our scoop. Our scoop holders will be exposed to us. I said, we have to have a single A rated for if they are not single A, what would happen? We've already signed two MOUs one with the Asian Development Bank, another with the uh, African Development Bank, to give what is known as 
great enhancement to those countries that are below single A. And so we would widen the scope of where we can tap our assets. Most countries don't have this single A. That was one of the condition of S&P, but in order to mitigate that risk, we, we signed these two MOUs. And by the way, you can have a credit enhancement in Ijara according to our Sharia. But before we got that ruling clear cut, you could, we used to say to them, you do that outside of our structure. So for example, if a country, let's say Philippines, right, whose rating is below single A, if they wanted to come to us to raise some funds, we'll say, well, your cumulative support, but you can call the development bank to have a credit rate uh, enhancement. That's outside our, outside our structure. And hence, in that, we believe we have separated the risk of the issuer from ours, because when we issued our scope, although if Philippine, for example, in this case, if they don't pay the, the lease, right, our scope holder will be exposed to the AAA rating of the Asian Development Bank. If at the end of the this whole this tenor, sorry, the fifth year, if they say we cannot buy our asset back, uh, the school holders will be exposed to also the AAA uh, Asian Development Bank. So in a way, we have measured that or managed that risk, I think, in an appropriate way. That's how we 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 try not to uh, we try to separate the risk of the asset provider from our risk and not to disclose, but by the way, our next Sharia round table, which will be in, I forgot the early, when is the on? April, okay. It's going to be on disclosing why we do not disclose uh, the, the identity or the name of the asset provider, just like we say here, right, the Philippines. We don't disclose them, why? We're going to discuss this in a round table of Sharia, where we have invited all more than our Sharia members. We have invited Sharia members from all over. They, some of them will provide, will, will, will present papers and others will be discussing. But then we open the floor for everyone. We always like to put any, anything that goes at the back of the mind of the individual to a discussion. We like to put it at a discussion so that they can feel comfortable from that. They can ask whatever question they like in that and what not, because we saw that some have been finding that as a nagging issue. In order to, to kill it from a discussion point of view, we decided to put it as one of the topic of our round table and Sharia issues. I hope that will succeed. Okay. Thank you. But, uh, uh, thank you, Professor, for the lecture. It's very enlightening. Uh, and thank you again for coming in. I have a, I a question of something that I probably missed. First of all, you say you are not sovereign. I think you understood that one. And that's, at the same time, also you said the, your scoop is uh, as, uh, backed by sovereign assets. But also you said sovereign assets cannot be sold. I mean, the government cannot sell it. So this is really actually the issue of uh, liability. So if uh, I am for any reason or another I've defaulted, so I am an investor, what can I do? Okay. The other thing also about the, the target, whom, whom we are targeting, are all the Islamic banks or others? Because if you ask other investors who are not probably not Islamic, they might also, there's an issue here, because you see, you do not have an asset in your hand. You're telling me that, okay, you have an asset that is sovereign, but it is not in your hand. So that is, a, I guess, a, a question. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. According to the Articles of Agreement, the ILM is a sovereign body. Supranational. It's not a sovereign. We don't have any. So I said we don't have any jurisdiction. So what we, what our government board said to us, your asset must be sovereign. I, I cannot take it from a corporate, right? So that's a distinction in our assets, either sovereign or corporate. Mine should be sovereign assets. I, I asset that belongs to a sovereign. But I do not issue sovereign scope. I'm not a sovereign. I'm a supranational. I get an asset from a sovereign, they'll sell it to me, right? And I can sell it, but you said they don't, I said to re correctly, yes, very difficult for a, for a sovereign to sell their assets because if the government who does that, for example, if you look at Singapore, the late Lee Kuan Yew made it almost impossible to sell a sovereign asset, right? But then through our structure, the one that based on common law, 
and beneficial ownership. I think we might to convince some of them. So they don't see they sell it to a local SPV. That's the structure, how the structure goes. And the SPV will sell it to us after they lease it back, right? If it's a tangible one that comes under the 51%. Now, when they lease it back to them, we decide what should be the lease. And I said, because we are not a profit making organization, we always look at how much would that sovereign, if they were to issue a scoop or a bond in the market. Let's say they will issue it at LIBOR plus 300, right? We will issue it to them, we will, we will fix the lease to be LIBOR plus, let's say 297, okay? And so we will be always be less than what is the market. That's the moment. So they still sell it to their local SPV, which will sell us that local SPV, what Khalid said. They will sell to us Sukuk on based on beneficial ownership. Okay. I cannot take the runaway away, but if you have a SUC, you have a beneficial ownership in that SUC, right? And that's how it overcomes the issue of Dubai, for example, under the last financial crisis. People were saying, how can I have my asset back? You have an asset, which is a suck, right? And I think that's a development in itself and innovation, is that you are now selling a suck and gives you a beneficial ownership in, in an asset, in a sovereign. For the sovereign, they don't care now, right? For me, I can sell it to everywhere. One of our primary dealers once came to me and he said, I bought from your support 70 or 80 million, I can't remember one. Of them. I said, what did you do with that? He said, I think it was 70 million. He said, I kept 40 million because that was a good rated uh, asset for us. I said, okay, you kept that to manage your liquidity. He said, yes. I said, what did you do with the 70 million? He said, I sold it to a fund manager in the UK. That is your other question. Are we selling it to Standard Banks? In the article, it says to facilitate liquidity management of institutions that offer Islamic financial services. So, I cannot say, right, I cannot say it cannot go to convention otherwise. As long as they see the risk pretend there is okay for them, it's up to them. But my initial and primary objective is to facilitate the liquidity management for institutions that offer Islamic financial services. Yes, go ahead. Yes, that's what I mean. Ah, okay. Yes. So the other question, you said there is no disclosure, you do not disclose where the origin of the assets. Yes. Uh, and do you think that you're seeing in Malaysia is also a factor? Because if you, if you are somewhere else, because the, the, the market will raise you according to where you are. If you are saying Sudan, are you able, can you be able to raise 1.8 billion? Okay. Now? Yes, let me tell you something. Although the ILM follows the sanctions of the United Nations. There are what is called market forces. Sudan, for example, today, if I go, uh, I myself, I had to sign what is known as uh, sanctions policy. Why? Because market players, let's say, let's take, for example, Standard Chartered. If today I get an asset from Sudan and I pay them, right? None of those who work with me will accept to work with me. In primary deals, they will not. Even our external auditors will not. Price Waterhouse, because the United States will penalize them, right, in their own jurisdiction, in the states. They will be deprived from working there because they have collaborated with the institution, the island, which has brought a sanctioned country. That's why we don't touch any of the sovereign countries. And we put that in our docu legal documentation with the countries. If today, for example, I work with country A, tomorrow they will become subject to a sanction. They have to buy their asset back. No problem for us. We cannot because that's market forces sanctions. It's not United Nations sanctions. And market forces because none of those market players around you, either in terms of primary dealers, even our external auditors, I said, they will not work with you. So what? how can you issue? So it, it depends on where you, you place yourself. That's what I'm saying. Well, and not necessarily Malaysia because out when we offer our support, the market will look at your risk return of the scoop. If today I'm in Malaysia, let's say, and I issue a junk scoop, will they still buy the same way? <laughs> okay, anyway, thank you.
Assalamu alaikum. I have a couple of quick questions. One is, uh, do you envision uh, ILM championing in the future the usage of maybe an inter-Islamic uh, library rate sort of thing, instead of basing your price on library? So what's the role uh, of ILM in that regard? And secondly, in terms of your internal governance and committees that you have, uh, are they chaired by the shareholders themselves, or are they chaired by your internal teams? And third thing, how do you manage get Luxembourg involved? That's very curious. Thank you. Okay. I got the second and third question. What was the first question? Sorry. How do you, uh, you see the role of Ireland pushing ahead with this inter-Islamic okay. lateral uh, rate instead of, I, I think, got it. yeah, Ireland alone, <laughs> the Islamic okay. industry starts to push it. Okay. Can I answer the second and third because they are easier than this? <laughs> <laughs> My board committees, they are chaired by the board members, right? Each one, these committees, they comprise mainly from the boards. So, for example, the BC, as stated in our articles and bylaws, it should be chaired by government. But the board uh, audit committee is chaired by uh, someone from Turkey, Dr. Najat, right? He is uh, a member of the, of the board of directors of the Central Bank of Turkey. Uh, our board risk management committee is chaired by uh, somebody from Central Bank of Qatar, right? because the Central Bank of Qatar nominates who should be there. And even the Sharia committee is not ours. They nominate, we only are allowed to nominate one person. But among themselves, the Sharia committee, they decide who should be the chair, but none from our management. And the remuneration committee is chaired by the governor of his excellency, the governor of Kuwait, and other members. By the way, uh, the IDB has nominated Khalid here as a member of the remuneration committee. And so we do not have anyone in these committees. That's how the governance works. Right? Okay, how did we get Luxembourg? Because initially we only allowed the members of the IFSB to come on board. Luxembourg was and still is uh, a member of the IFSB. And so they nominated themselves. At the time there was Governor Merch, a very strong supporter of Islamic finance. He has now moved from the, being the governor of the Central Bank of Luxembourg to become a member of the executive committee, I think, of the European Central Bank. Yes. So they joined, and he was there until uh, October 2012. He attended the governing board, which was attend, uh, held in, in Tokyo alongside the IMF World Bank meetings. I saw him there, yes. So Luxembourg is a member there because they were members of the RSB. So far, if you look at it, all the current members of the ILM are members of the IFSB. In future, that may change, I don't know. Okay, now you speak about library Islam. What we would like to do is, you see people are talking about a lender of last resort, right? We have changed that. We have even put forward some suggestions to become an investor rather than a lender, an investor of last resort because if you were to lend someone, that comes again from the convention bank. If I take money from you, from a central bank convention, right? They would not just give it to you, they will lend it to you, right? A lending has to, in the conventional way, has to have a return. But we spoke about an investor of last resort. I, you invest in the island school. We, we presented two, two proposals to our governing board. I cannot speak about this more, but perhaps in future, we will be able, I don't know, we will be able to substitute the library to something else. We haven't focused on that, but I have to be honest with you. Okay. Yeah, maybe just, just one question before we conclude. Thank you uh, for sharing the story. One of the uh, main objective of establishing the ILM was also to help establish and uh, promote a robust secondary market uh, for spook in the Islamic package. Not to my knowledge in the Articles of Agreement. Not to? Not to my knowledge. I know that they have to facilitate liquidity management of institutions that offer Islamic finance service. Uh, Cross-border, I think, also. Yes. Well, to 
that because that's why we lose the cross border that's why we use the international reserve currency the second one is the uh, intergovernmental interregional uh, is the interregional one the cooperation integration of interregional but i'm not sure about the point you raised okay. so uh yeah. so the response of the primary leaders and everyone who buys this book uh, does ILM report on how the response is uh, from these institutions or uh, is there a way to measure this uh, response from these institutions okay if you follow the fast with the system established there we have to fix the price because we said that's an agreed pricing we agree the price with all the primary dealers we say next auction for example is going to be libel plus 35 or 40 whatever it is right and then it goes to the fast because the fast has to put it in the system right that's seven days before the primary dealers that's their uh, that's their function there they know it before so they prepare themselves on the day of the auction they have to send us their form they have to send it either manual or electronically electronically they have to inform fast right at the end of the of the of the auction we will calculate how much it was oversubscribed and whatnot but in the press release we never state you know how much it was at the point in time our swoop were oversubscribed by more than 200. we never say that in our press release the last one for example was oversubscribed by 123 or 172 they said although it was the biggest offering 1 billion point 1.34 billion us dollar we never say in the in the press release that it was oversubscribed you see i think we somebody accused us of being very modest not i that's how we work i think you know but the most important for us is not to default because in that respect we are managing the risk of our shareholders we don't want to expose our shareholders to any of that risk to be honest right and so perhaps at the time we why you, you may say why don't we go for a competitive bid rather than a grid bid i say because we're trying to protect the standard banks the big banks the convention big banks stand chartered they may overtake them easily they are big banks right and so i think the agreed bid helps the standard banks in their bidding there thank you very much uh, for your participation in this event uh, i'm sure we have benefited a lot from this session uh, as usual, let us show our appreciation to our distinguished speaker today, Professor Rahul Khadi. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. I hope that was useful. Hi. Hi. Hi.